Good morning. Uh, good morning. So uh, today we're going to start off uh, where we left off last time, uh, which was really at the end of looking at how sort of our first view of how action potentials fire. Um, does anybody have any questions from last time? In particular? All right, so at last time we went through a cycle. And this cycle was changes in membrane permeability that were going on as sodium went in, forms this rapid upstroke of the action potential. We see this pore here. And then we have potassium, potassium and calcium going through, through the entire plateau of the action potential through these little holes here with some problems. Calcium doesn't actually go out of the action potential through a, a pore at any point. Um, uh, sodium and potassium finally at the end. And then of course, at rest, it's almost all potassium, not a high sodium permeability as shown here with the sodium going into the channel or into the cell. So sort of, we have this cardiac action potential it's a pretty complicated event. It involves multiple channel types. That is, the different um, molecules open at different times in a synchronized way to fire an action potential. That varies with the region of the heart, but in virtually all tissue, except for those slow tissues, we have some things in common. The sodium channel usually dominates the upstroke. For all the working myocardium under normal circumstances, the stuff that actually does the contraction and, and goes fast, or that fast tissue, is dominated by sodium currents. Calcium flows actually throughout the action potential, so for the very late phases of it. And potassium turns on slowly and eventually dominates and returns things down to that resting membrane potential uh, when we are near rest. So how does a channel work? Well, we have that 3D structure of a channel. And that 3D structure is very interesting in terms of uh, understanding of protein and such. But our understanding of how channels work started out long before we knew anything about their protein structure by uh, someone named a group of people, uh, two in particular, Hodgkin and Huxley, uh, who worked on uh, the squid axon. And what they said was, that you have these channels, they're proteins, they open and close <coughs> thermodynamically. So they're the sort of random events that you saw earlier. Um, but thermodynamically means that, of course, the motion of any one cha channel particle, <coughs> part of the channel, is random, but it occurs with a bias. And what they said was that there are probably multiple gates for something like the sodium channel. And mathematically analyzing their data and abstracting it, they brought these down to what is in your textbook a very simplified diagram of an M and an H gate. M is what's known as the activation gate, and H is what's known as the inactivation gate. And these are mathematical abstractions, okay? They're not really physical gates. The mathematical abstractions that are used to describe the way in which the channel, sodium channel, opens and closes in response to changes in membrane potential. So that S4 is going to drag these things around. They're going to change. And they made a lot of assumptions about them, which we'll talk about a little bit later. But basically this idea that there are at least two gates in a channel, perhaps more. So at rest, you have a resting membrane potential, the cardiac action potential. You might be held down, you know, minus 80, minus 90, or very, very low. And so there's electrostatic forces acting on that S4 positive charge. And that holds the channel gates in a particular conformation. We have our M gate, which is always held closed at rest. We have our H gate, which is called an inactivation gate, which is held open at rest. And there's some difference between the two. M and H have very different behaviors. M 
gates much faster and is closed at rest. H gates much more slowly and is normally open at rest. And when you depolarize the cell, what happens? Well, the first thing you do is you reach that threshold. When you reach that threshold we talked about, the all or none threshold, you start to open up that M gate. As you open up that M gate, what happens? Well, the H gate is still open because it acts much more slowly. You're still at fairly negative potentials. So the M gate starts to open. When the M gate opens, the channel is open. You have a pore that goes all the way in and all the way through the membrane. And so the sodium can rush in. What happens when sodium rushes in? It pushes the membrane potential up near the sodium Nernst potential. Notice I mentioned Nernst potential again. That's one of the key terms uh, that you really need to know for this. So it goes to the sodium Nernst potential, which is up around, you know, let's say plus 50 millivolts, depending on the exact sodium concentration inside the cell and outside the cell. In this particular case, they say, of course, it's 60 millivolts. But it starts rushing in, and so it creates positive charges on the inside, which tends to neutralize it. We move up to zero millivolts. The channel is way, way open. This is what generates this all or none type of depolarization. Once you start to open up a few sodium channels, the sodium goes in, starts to depolarize the membrane. That brings in more positive charge. More positive charge works harder on that M gate, pushes it out of the way even faster, so even more comes in. And it's a regenerative process. It grows on itself. So once you hit that critical threshold, the sodium coming in discharges the membrane, the discharge of the membrane pushes more M gates open, more M gates open, more sodium comes in, and it's a vicious cycle, if you will, in which the more you open it, the further open it gets. That's why there's an all or none <coughs> threshold for depolarization. But sodium, even though the voltage is zero here, so there's no net charge on either side, Sodium is going in because its concentration gradient is still inward. So it continues to go, and it goes even more positive <coughs> until you get quite positive and, and reverse polarize the cells, where you have an overshoot or any of several terms that are used to describe this phenomenon by which you start approaching the sodium reversal potential. As you start to report re as you start to approach the reversal potential for sodium, the net gradient is getting to be smaller and smaller, pushing ions in. Because you have positive charges here, repelling these positive charges. And eventually, if you get all the way up to the nurse reversal potential, this net flux will be zero. So even though the channel is very, very open and fully activated, you're actually getting less and less current as you get up further and further. So this is what they mean when they say the net driving force is small. And then there's a second component, which they talk about here and aren't showing. And that's the inactivation gate. The inactivation gate is normally open at rest. At positive potentials, it starts to close. So once you get up above a certain potential, it starts to close down and shut down the channel. And its gating characteristics are much, much slower than the M gate, so that you end up in a state something like this, up at around plus 30 millivolts. The M is, is essentially zero, or essentially one. Everything's activated. It's ready to conduct. But this slow process of inactivation has taken over and has shut down the channel. And it's going to stay shut down until you return to the resting membrane potential. And even then, it's going to occur slowly. So what happens then, as you go back down to rest, as K comes in through K channels, which aren't shown on here, or say, sorry, K goes out through potassium channels, which aren't shown on here, and you return to your inside negative conformation, very quickly, M goes back to closed. So it's, it's not going to allow permeation. And much more slowly than the MH gate recovers. So you go through this cycle of activation, inactivation, and recovery. So channel opens, but it only opens transi transiently. It only opens transiently because it has multiple gates. Those fastest gates 
open in response to depolarization. Those are called your activation gates. Oh, it's in bold, and it's on a line, and it's underlined. Um, and then you have a slower gate. In general, an activation is slower. It's not always slower, but 99% of the time is a much slower process than the process of activation. And so this slower gate shuts down the open channel in response to a sustained depolarization and gives you a transient behavior. In the sodium channel, that's why you get this behavior here of GNA. GNA is very transient. It's actually highest, not where current is highest, because that's where DVDT, or the upstroke of the action potential is highest. That's where the current is highest. But it is highest up here before well, the, where the M gate is fully open, and the H gate has not yet had a chance to close and shut down that conductance. Then we have this transient behavior. So transient meaning, of course, it turns on and turns off. Calcium flows throughout the action potential. And it may or may not have this exact shape that's on there. Sort of the generality is, though, that the calcium channel turns on. It's like the sodium channel. It has activation. It has inactivation. Uh, particularly the inactivation, as well as the activation, are slower. Inactivation is much slower, so that it really only starts turning off fairly late in the action potential and is dominant is active pretty much all through the cycle of the action potential. Now, GK, the conductance through the K channel here, this is one that inevitably confuses everyone. Every year we've taught this course, it confuses everyone. And the conductance, remember that's the ability of the channel to admit ions as, as related by Ohm's law, rephrased. Instead of resistance, we have conductance. So instead of V equals IR, we have I equals GV. The conductance actually goes down in this thing. And a lot of this is very confusing because these aren't on the same scale. GNA would be off the page here. It would be up top if this was all drawn to scale. Uh, similarly, uh, at rest, the conductance for the potassium current is actually the largest. So we have resting high potassium conductance. That's what keeps your resting membrane potential near EK. And then we have this really confusing thing here. Throughout the action potential until very, very late, your conductance actually goes down. You're not producing much current through a K channel. Now, every time I've talked about this, we've talked about K channels turning on and driving the membrane repolarized. How do you resolve that apparent inconsistency within the text. Well, not through the use of this figure. This figure is very confusing because of where the lines are drawn and how they are drawn. What is resulting here is that as you fire an action potential, it lasts a very, very long time. So if you want to minimize the amount of power that you discharge during this, you need to not flow very much current during the action potential plateau. And there are two ways you can do that. One is to have a very close balance of inward and outward currents so that the net current is very close to zero, and, but the currents are very, very large. Or you can have less total current at the plateau. And in fact, cardiac muscle really uses a combination of these two. We have a fine balance of that calcium current and time-dependent potassium currents there, but we have a very low conductance during the plateau. So if you think of power as being discharged in terms of watts, it's I squared R. So the more current you get, the square function of that, the more energy your cell is going to use during that phase. And the way nature has worked around that is with these two-barreled pores, or sorry, two membrane-spanning domain pores that we showed you earlier. They're called inward rectifiers. Inward rectifiers are channels which pass current more readily in the inward direction versus the outward direction relative to their reversal potentials. This is not to say what they do physiologically. This is an entirely 
biophysical term used to describe them, inward rectification, rectifier. This was taken from the idea of diodes uh, that occurred in, and much of the mathematics for describing the, perfusion, the diffusion process that occurs for, for causing rectification is applicable to vacuum tubes and semiconductor physics. It means exactly what it says. You just don't pass current in the outward direction very well, you pass it in the inward well. But you still have to obey thermodynamics. So you see EK here. EK is where the neuron strip potential for potassium is. The inward rectifier is a potassium channel. This potassium channel, below its neuron strip potential, so below minus 80 or minus 90, is passing inward current. How can it do this? Well, physiologically, in an animal cell, your membrane potential really never ever goes below the resting, uh, your resting membrane potential, which is always slightly positive to EK, or positive to the Nernst potential for potassium. So physiologically, inward rectification doesn't have anything to do with the movement of the current inward or outward. It is merely means that experimentally, if you put an electrode in a cell and you look at it, what you see is that it, you get negative currents if you artificially, experimentally control the cell to go into this negative range of potentials, you get huge negative currents. But as you get positive, you carry outward current for a ways, but very, very little current. And so when you're sitting here, starting here, at your action potential, you go depolarized very rapidly up here, you're actually conducting less, you have less conductance, less current through, through this channel than you do down here where there's much less of a driving force. Remember, v, v equals IR. This would be a line that went straight up following the slope in the negative regions up through the ceiling. Inward rectification means we pass a lot less current. And that less current means that as you go through an action potential, you know, you don't see that bump right here simply because it's, it's too fast for this time scale. But you see it shut down because it's up there. That this IK1, inward rectifier, that's another name for it, shuts down. As you go through repolarization, you see a blip upward in that. As you move up that little hump there, it produces outward current and stabilizes the membrane potential. You get a high conductance down at the resting membrane potential. Why do you want a high conductance in working myocardium? For your resting membrane potential? Well, because you really only want to contract your working myocardium when you want it to contract. Otherwise, you want a very stable thing that's holding it down there, allowing it to relax and go on. But once you've decided to do that, once you've brought it above your threshold, you don't want to be fighting currents with currents, and so you have th this current going on. Again, not drawn really to scale here, we have a whole host of things going on. Sodium current firing very early, very large. Calcium current, this one has it inactivating earlier in the action potential. It flows through most of the action potential. And then we have this pump or exchanger that's going on, I INACA, this, this exchanger that is exchanging three sodiums for two calciums. And you see that it changes its direction during the action potential but in general works mostly in this range here to extrude calcium and return the action potentials to rest. We have multiple cal potassium currents, the transient outward current. In fact, we have two types of transient outward currents at least. ITO1, a very fast recovering one, generally uh, conveyed by KV 1.4, or sorry, 4.1. Perhaps an ITO2 uh, carried by KV 1.4. Uh, which slowly recovers, has some slower kinetics. Then we have IKR and IKS, these delayed rectifiers, which turn on slowly with, with sustained depolarization and build up until they finally overpower what's left of the calcium current and any of the other inward currents that go on. And so it's a complex interaction between several currents here, despite the sort of simplicity of this shape that goes on during the action potential. <clears throat> so sodium only fires transiently, and it's uninvolved until it recovers from inactivation for the next action potential. Turns on, turns off. There are cases and, and situations in which 
that inactivation is impaired in some sense or perhaps not quite complete and may contribute a little concurrent to that action potential. Sometimes that can be very serious and leads to the disease long QT syndrome. Calcium also inactivates, but much more slowly, so that you've got it coming in during the course of the action potential. And it's part of the mechanism by which you regulate the strength, duration of contraction and relaxation. And resting potassium conductance. Conductance is high, but it has an inward rectification property. Inward rectification. So these dynamic currents and these time dependencies build up during the action potential, and they force the repolarization to occur. So you go through this set of events. You hit this all or none threshold with the sodium current, where, it's where the more it opens, the more it activates itself, until you finally fire an action potential and things go through a complete cycle. Then as you come down, you have this set of, as you come down repolarization, you have this set of currents here that have to reset. So we have this H gate in the sodium channel that has to reset. Um, in some texts, calcium channel inactivation is referred to as an F gate. Uh, similarly, there's the great gates for the transient outward current. Uh, none of these are quite as systematized in their nomenclature as the uh, sodium current. But what you can see is that they affect what happens during that relative refractory period. So as you come down here uh, during repolarization, as you're returning your resting membrane potential, you're resetting all these things. The first thing to start resetting is the one that activates the most positive potentials. So that's your calcium current. So it starts to recover from inactivation, and you can fire an action potential. But it's very slow in its upstroke, meaning that calcium, of course, is a much smaller current, carries a much smaller amount to depolarize that membrane, and you get a sort of a small, slow action potential from that. As you go more negative, the sodium current begins to reset itself. You get more of an abrupt upstroke from the sodium current. And of course, these K currents start to decay as well as you go back out, giving you a more robust upstroke, because as you report, so there will be less K active at the beginning of that, that phase. So fairly complicated set of interactions here, calcium recovering first, sodium, and then more slowly than that, even potassium currents resetting. So the calcium currents fire at a more positive range than sodium currents, and the action potentials during the relative refractory period switch from being a slow type mediated by calcium as you're coming down that curve and switch to a fast type of the sodium. Same thing goes with drug action then. Drug action doesn't just necessarily abolish the action potential, it changes its characteristics. So when you block, for instance, the sodium channel with progressive levels of drug, you change it, you do the same thing that you see at the edge of repolarization. You block this rapid upstroke, which is what the sodium current does. This is one of the reasons we know that. Uh, a drug called TTX will block this, tetrodotoxin, saxitoxin. Um, you may <coughs> wonder sometimes when they close the beaches on the Atlantic coast the, with the Atlantic red tide, that's saxitoxin that's in these. It's the poison, uh, a, a poison that works, acts on so sodium channels. It's also uh, very analogous to tetrodotoxin or TTX, which comes from a particular type of salamanders and is probably most, uh, <laughs> most famous for being the uh, toxin that's in fugu, uh, which gives you apparently quite a tingle in your mouth if it's prepared correctly uh, as sushi, but uh, can be um, fairly lethal on your respiratory system uh, in terms of firing action potentials uh, through the sodium current. So that's what, that's what TTX does. And then the heart, we have calcium currents as a backup as opposed to certain other tissues. So it switches from sodium mediated action potentials to the slow calcium mediated action potentials, which have a very different sort of behavior. These overlapping currents also then provide you with differences in shape of action potential as you change rates and rhythms. And this is uh, actually work from Charlie Anselovich's group. Uh, in your textbook. Um, he's, uh, he's right here in upstate New York. He's over in Utica. And his claim to fame is looking at the 
the role of this transient outward current in forming this notch, and then really the great prolongation type of behavior that occurs in these M or midmyocardial cells. So different regions of the ventricle have different action potential characteristics. <coughs> so you have early on, at reasonably fast rates, action potential is fairly uniform across the, uh, the wall of the ventricle. You have this spike and dome shape, which we'll see again and again, that occurs and is variable in its morphology. Um, and it's also variable because of the level of delayed rectifiers. And so when you go to very, very long periods, you have this excessive prolongation of action potentials, particularly in the mid myocardial cells, but also in the epicardial cells. With an enhancement of this notch here, where the calcium current is firing and that transient outward current are firing in overlapping ways. So it's not necessary for you to know the details of each and every single one of those. You should know a little bit about the generality of it and know that these actually reflect the diversity of ion channels that strongly affect function and potential uh, pathology in things. And they affect different regions of the heart differently because different action potentials have different shapes. So we'll extend that here. to look at electrical diversity and function of these cardiac ion channels, really looking at the role of the ion channels underlying this diversity of behavior. So I start out with this sort of bland looking statement. The cardiac action potential arises from a complex cellular system. Um, that's not really very useful. I mean, we know it's complicated. I say that probably once every 10 minutes. Here is a diagram that gives you maybe a little better understanding of the various components of it. And you should recognize all these things from things that I have talked about in the preceding two lectures. This is a computer model. This is actually research uh, from my own lab of a cardiac single cell and how it works. So it's, it's a model. Um, it's not a, uh, a visual model. This is a computer model. And so each one of these things represents something different. We have different ion concentrations inside and outside of the cell. And we have ion channels, quite a lot of them. We have your L-type calcium channel here. We have your L-type calcium channel here. It also, of course, faces parts of the, the cell. We have background currents. We have this transient outward fast, transient outward slow. Two delayed rectifier channels, IKS and IKR. Um, an IKUR in this particular case, which is common in human atrium. IK steady state, uh, background current of unknown origin. Um, and then we have IK1, uh, which is our inward rectifier, critical to all non-pacemaker types of uh, channels. And of course, the chloride channel, sodium, and the sodium current, which mediates the fast upstroke of the action potential. So all these things have to work in coordination. And what we usually do in order to understand a system like that, because no matter how much you stare at a diagram like this, it's not gonna help beyond a certain point, is we use computer modeling to do that. And we look then at the interaction with certain things like that sodium potassium ATPase pump, sarcolemmal calcium extrusion, dyadic space here, where we look at calcium entry, and this calcium comes in, diffuses across a small space, binds to this release channel. Here, that's the rionidine-sensitive release channel, or the rionidine channel, uh, the uh, sarcoplasmic reticulum calcium release channel. We have our junctional SR and terminal cisternae here, and then we have our non-junctional SR, that's sort of this collection thing. It has some leaks in it but it's largely got this circa in it that uptakes it and or transfers it. It binds intracellularly to cell cal sequestrin. And of course, as things get dumped out into the cell and they come in through the calcium channels, they have to go back out through the sodium calcium exchanger or back up through the junctional SR. But on their little transit through the cell, they bind to calmodulin and troponin, the various other binding proteins, 
and give us a net physiologic effect that we call contraction. So what you can see here is there are multiple types of potassium channels. There's not that many. It's not like the brain where this would be a much, much, much larger list and depend on neurons. Uh, so it's a finite number with various classes that you can, can sort of grasp. And they give rise to the action potential. So broadly classed, we have two. We have sodium and calcium currents, which are depolarizing or excitatory currents. If I ask you which are the excitatory currents in cardiac muscle, you would not say potassium currents. Pumps and exchangers can also contribute at various phases of the action potential. But in general, uh, with possible exception of the sodium-calcium exchanger, they kind of crank along in background trying to sort of basic, do basic housekeeping. And then there are the repolarizing currents. Repolarizing currents are always outward. Depolarizing currents are always inward. And the repolarizing currents are in cardiac muscle dominantly carried by K. There's really very little, under normal circumstances, chloride channel involvement. So dominant by K. So how does this thing work again here? What's going on here with this excitation? We have our excitation here. We get an increase in the conductance. This is our calcium coming in here. Fast upstroke. If we don't have a fast upstroke, we'll have a slow upstroke from the calcium current. Calcium current stays active during the plateau, and we have this change in K conductance overall. We have relatively high at rest, and relatively low during the plateau, the action potential. Why is that again? Inward rectification. That basal potassium current inwardly re rectifies. So that basal potassium, IK1, or the inward rectifier, rectifies. And what does that mean? It carries inward current better than it carries outward current. Its slope is bent. That's all it really means is this slope here is bent. So that bend in this slope means it still passes through EK. It cannot violate the laws of thermodynamics. This is like an enzyme. It can facilitate a reaction, but it can't change the equilibrium of the reaction. So if you think of the reaction as being the diffusion of ions across the membrane, it has to obey thermodynamics. Its equilibrium here is EEK. What it can do is keep it from going very fast in one direction, but allow it to go very fast in another direction. But you never see this physiologically because the membranes never de or never hyperpolarize past EK. There's no other current there to drive them to these very, very negative potentials in cardiac muscle. So this inward rectification means it carries inward current better than it carries outward current. It means that we lose very little energy through excessive K flow during the action potential. And that gives us this decrease here. But this decrease here really should be a little more complicated looking than it is because we have some other currents that are turning on there. And those currents are hidden in this, which is, of course, not to scale. That's what helps, what causes some of the problem. So you have a sodium current would be off the scale here. We have this current, which would be pretty big compared to the others. Now, these as conductances, see, this is conductances, these are currents. This transient outward current is actually pretty big. It may be a lower conductance, but it's a big current. Does anybody know why it would be a big current, even though it's a lower conductance than IK1? Well, that has to do with reversal potentials. So remember, we are opening a channel here for this transient outward current, and it's the diffusion of ions through it. If EK is minus 90, and you're sitting at minus 85, you only have 5 millivolts of driving force. So you have to have a high conductance in order to carry even a modest amount of current. Whereas up here, if you are at, say, plus 50 millivolts, and EK is at minus, minus uh, 90, you got 140 millivolts instead of 5 millivolts driving current through that channel. So a much lower conductance will cause a much higher current. So we can get a pretty good sized current through there, even though the conductance here is, is different. So this transient outward current, we may have multiple ones 
And then we have these delayed rectifiers, same things. They turn on slowly, they integrate with time. And so both of, both of these inward rectifiers, there are two types, the IKR, or rapid or rectifying uh, delayed rectifier, and IKS, the slowly developing delayed rectifier, cause integration, or are responsible for integration between action potentials. So again, let me emphasize conductance is highest during the upstroke. During the plateau, the potassium conductance starts low and starts to increase because of these delayed rectifier channels. There is some transient change in the K conductance, which can be kind of high due to that transient outward current. But in general, the thing that repolarizes it is that you get partial inactivation of the calcium channel and this slow buildup of other repolarizing currents. How do we know this? How do we measure these types of things? Well, we do that through an experimental process called voltage clamp. And it's an experimental method for measuring ion currents in cells. Uh, rather than let things run around in action potentials all the time, what it does is it applies step changes in potential, controls the action potentials, controls the membrane potential very, very tightly, and examines how these channels respond at different voltage voltages. So you have the voltage constant and the time-dependent properties are observed. So if you go to the literature and you start to look at things, and again, these are some examples uh, from my own work, you start to see some diagrams that look a bit intimidating. And uh, no, you're not responsible for actually being able to read and interpret all the information here, but you should be able to pick out a few different uh, things about it. So what this is, is a set of voltage clamp experiments. An ion has, or a ion, on a channel has been isolated. That is, we've set up the chemical conditions and solutions so that we can see a particular ion channel. So we might only have sodium as a permeate ion, for instance. And so we can isolate the sodium current. And so we hold it minus, let's say, 90, minus 100, experimentally. You step positive. As you step positive, you see nothing for a while. You step more and more positive, so you're going from minus 90, positive, and this is current and time on this axis. This is what's, what is going to happen without you know, having this regenerative process where more ch sodium channels open, more sodium channels because of changes in voltage. You're just going to control that voltage. Eventually, you start to reach, you get nothing and nothing, and then you reach this all or none threshold or the beginning of what would be this all or none threshold. You don't have that all or none threshold behavior because you are controlling that cell membrane. So the amount of sodium that goes in does not change the membrane potential. It merely gets recorded by your electrode. And so once you get up to a certain point, you see no current, no current here. And so we're measuring the peak current during these traces. Then all of a sudden, you reach, say, minus uh, 60 or so. You start to see current, and it turns on. It's negative, so it's inward. An inward current, this is the inward movement of sodium ions through the channel. You can see this delay of, of M8, M gate opening, and you don't see much in the way of inactivation. As you step more positive, so you go up to the next, so, so the peak here would be plotted here as a peak. As you step more positive, you see another peak. It's gone, it's turned on. A lot more channels have turned on you see a much bigger peak, and that we might plot here. Then, as you go even more positive, you'll see a really big peak. And you've turned that M gate on, and look at that. You start to turn this M H gate on faster and faster as it opens and shuts down. So this is what sodium currents look like under voltage clamp. This is what we do, and as we go more and more positive, the currents get faster and faster. They turn on faster, they turn off faster. And they sort of go up towards, in this particular case, let's say minus 40 millivolts. Why are they doing that? Why are these currents getting lots and lots smaller? Well, the M gate is turned on all the way. Maybe we're getting a little bit of overlap with the H gate, but I'll tell you right now, that's not the problem. As you go more and more positive, everything's turned on, and it's still taking time to turn off, but you have less driving force on that sodium through the channel as you get to its nerds potential. So there's a difference between diffusion through the channel, 
and how open it is. Here, the amount of conductance, amount of ions, steeply increases because you're turning on that M gate and you're changing that. And then as you go more positive. Now we have three lines here in this set of experimental data. I don't expect you to know this, but the reason that these change is that in order to measure the sodium current, sometimes you have to reduce its size. And one of the ways to reduce its size is to reduce the driving force on it. And so these are done at different sodium concentrations, and that's why they have different reversal potentials. Um, there's also two different populations, but you see this threshold here. But you see it's turning on very, very negative, around minus 60 or so. This is where that threshold for it is. And that more positive, we have what's known as inactivation, where, you know, that H gate is. And it starts out 1, 1 meaning 100% open. And it's sitting there at rest, and it's 100% open. And as it turns on and on, as you go more and more positive, it doesn't matter. But as you go more and more positive, all of a sudden that H gate ends up at the end of a very long pulse to be off or down here at zero or 100% closed. And so this is occurring, though, even more negative than this. So we have these fast sodium channel kinetics. They activate, turn on in response to the voltage of the membrane. They activate, they turn on, they inactivate, they turn off, M and H. And this activation and inactivation occurs at very, very negative potentials. Sort of what's going to happen in, this, in the shape of the action potential? How do we figure this out? Well, we look at the calcium current. And before I go to the calcium current, look at the time scale on this. This is 15 milliseconds here. So we go down to the calcium current. Here we go from the same sort of protocol. In this case, it's one, act, one step pulse followed by a second step pulse. That's why there are two of these here. Ignore that first, last part, but look at the scale here. 250 milliseconds. So this calcium current can't even be displayed on the same time scale as we had the sodium current. But its general behavior is about the same. It turns on rapidly in response to a step depolarization, and it turns off more slowly. Same sort of thing. And Everything here, this is minus 40, this is minus 20 to zero, is occurring much more positive. This is why I say you need a bigger stimulus and such when you have a slow action potential, you have to get up to a higher potential to get to that all or none threshold for eliciting a slow action potential. So it's these general principles that I want you to know. Don't worry too much about those charts. They're from research articles. They're there to illustrate a point about real data that calcium currents are not nearly so fast as sodium. They're displayed on you know, order of magnitude, different time scale. They activate rapidly and inactivate much more slowly. They activate and inactivate more positively than sodium channels. So sodium channels fire first during that action potentials, and then calcium currents. And they all occurring more negative than those for the potassium currents. So again, that's why when you go from this to this, you see this nice rapid upstroke, and you see this decrease, which you don't see here. And in fact, you've got to add a really big stimulus in the front of it. So how do we know that these things are active in the various processes we say they are? Well, we can block them. Sodium current, we know about that action potential because we can block that time course of development of the action potential in, in this particular rapid upstroke. But you see that the action potential durations are fairly unchanged. When we go to calcium currents, we can block calcium currents. And what happens to the action potential there? Well, we know calcium current is a pretty small current relative to the sodium current. But what we see is that that upstroke is unchanged because it's dominated by that sodium current, which is so much larger than the others. And we see that as you block it, in this particular case with diltiazem, uh, you block it with progressively higher doses. What you see is a shortening of the action potential. And what you also see is the lack of that trigger there for entry of additional calcium. So this calcium now is, the action potential is getting shorter. The calcium transient is occurring earlier in time because of that. 
and it's also relaxing earlier. So you're getting less release because you have less calcium-induced calcium release. You have been occurring at an earlier time, and you have it relaxing faster with block of the calcium channel. So this is how we know it's one of the ways we can verify that it is involved in that process. So block of calcium channels have some effects. They shorten your action potential. They decrease that calcium con con transient and thereby decrease the strength of contraction and they cause an earlier relaxation because they've shortened your action potential. Similarly, we have this business here. Again, if you think of it in terms of those sodium and potassium currents, you have repolarization. On the way up, we have sodium firing way down here. And this is where all of its kinetics behavior is occurring. And we have calcium current, its kinetic behavior is up here. And of course, potassium current's a little bit above. And so we repolarize. We're going to go backwards through that exact same cycle. Calcium currents are going to start to recover first because they're going back to their resting levels. They're going back to what they would be at minus, you know, minus uh, 40 and minus 50, where the activation would be removed and they would be normal. So that as you go back and you fire a premature action potential from this time, you get this slow action potential. As you go more and more negative, you're going back into the sodium range of currents, and you see a, a more rapid upstroke firing. So calcium currents fire a more positive range than sodium currents. So they're second to fire, but they're first to recover. And action potentials during that refractory period are switching from sodium-mediated to calcium-mediated action potentials. And it's recovery from inactivation that governs this behavior. That is how it goes from that transient there. It turns on, it turns off, and then if it's ready to fire again, it has to have that off switch reset back to on. So if you think of M and H, M has to be in its resting position, ready to be you know, open, but it does that fairly quickly. H is slower, and if it's off and you've turned it off from depolarization, it has to go back to being open or on at lower potentials. And one of the ways you can see this in terms of nodal tissue is that nodal tissue basically recovers its excitability at the same rate that that inactivation for calcium current recovers. We don't get this biphasic behavior in nodal tissue. You have an action potential, you try and fire a premature one, you get a kind of a blip. You might, if you give it a big enough stimulus here, you know, pre a small action potential. As you wait longer and longer, you get back to a normal thing. But it is very much simpler in the nodal cell. We don't have two currents recovering at the same time. And recovery from inactivation really governs that transition between the absolute and relative refractory periods. So absolute and relative refractory periods, something you ought to know. Recovery from inactivation is that time-dependent resetting of the channel inactivation or shutdown that occurs after you sustain stimulus of the channel. It's not the same as desensitization. A lot of students get that confused. Desensitization, we're not going to talk about. Just don't worry about it. We are really talking about inactivation, which is a part of the normal dynamic changes of this. So during the course of the action potential, you really need to be able to step through these. Sodium only fires transiently and is largely uninvolved uh, in repolarization as it goes until it, you really start to fire the next action potential. So it's got to recover from inactivation. Calcium inactivates, does it a lot more slowly, and so it's active during most of the action potential. And resting potassium conductance is high at rest, but it didn't really rectify. So it plays very little role. The inward rectifier plays very little role except for the very foot of that action potential, and the very hyperpolarized range of potentials. And we have dynamic potassium currents that build up during the action potential and force repolarization. So what are those dynamic currents? Well, <coughs> dynamic, I don't particularly mean you know, exciting or innovative, I simply mean time varying. Uh, the first one that starts to fire is really the fastest gated one. It has in some sense uh, the most con 
uh, complex kinetics in that it activates and inactivates. And it helps set this notch portion of the action potential. And here's some data from one of the researchers here at UB, uh, Dr. Don Campbell, who uh, looked at the effect of a specific blocker of this transient outward current on the ferret action potential. Here, this is real data as opposed to pictures in your book. You can see a few things on it if you look very carefully that are kind of overlooked. So you can see your resting membrane potential. It's just a short bit of it here around minus 80. And then there's this jagged bit here. What is it? It's the stimulus. You have to have some sort of stimulus for working myocardium to reach its all or none threshold. You reach your all or none threshold, then you activate sodium channels, you get your regenerative behavior, you fire an action potential, and you get this notch behavior here. That notch behavior is critically dependent on this transient outward current. So these are measured by putting an electrode in, giving a little stimulus current here, and watching the, the channels relax. In the same cell, or virtually the same cell, what you can do then is if you isolate those K currents, you can pulse positive, and instead then of allowing the action potential just to go wherever it wants, you clamp it. That is, you control it to a known voltage. And just like the sodium current, as you go, as you're holding down here at minus 80, you could step negative. If you step negative, what happens? Well, as a K current, you see this thing. This is the phenomenon of inward rectification. This is IK1 in these channels. And if you go positive, you see this inward rectification, which just doesn't carry much current. Until you step positive, step positive, step positive, then you start to elicit a little bump of current. That's what this peak is here. As you go more positive, you elicit a bump that's here. Oop. And here, and so on. And so you see that this starts to activate what? It's zero millivolts. So it's activating even more positive than the calcium channel or the sodium channel. And it opens, and then it, it drives this little notch, changes a little bit in this area of repolarization, and then it turns off. It turns on, turns off, and is largely uninvolved later. But this is the transient outward current. It fires first. That means that this notch is likely to be highly dependent because you have to recover from inactivation. As you go back down negative, so you've, you've held up positive for a while, and if you think of the action potential as being a square wave, you go down negative, you've got to recover for this to occur. That's what's done in these types of experiments. Here, this is multiple experiments all overlaid on each other. And what's been done is that we've held, say, at minus 90, we elicit a step depolarization, and we step negative, the channel opens, inactivates, turns off, and then we wait for a varying period of time at minus 60. You go a little bit longer, a little while, you get a little current. You wait not at all, you get no current. Inactivation just stays inactivated. But at minus 60, it starts to recover. As you go wait a little bit longer at minus 60 and then step positive, you get a bigger current. Until finally, you basically completely recover. So you sort of build that up. And that tells you that you're doing it at a particular speed. When you go to minus 90, recovery will get much, much, much faster. So recovery, that reversal of the inactivation process, also has dependence. As you go more negative, it gets faster. As you go more positive, it gets a bit slower. So the transient outward potassium current is responsible for that phase one notch in repolarization. It activates much more slowly than sodium or calcium, and it, and it does it at more positive potentials. So it's sort of really the third thing in there. It inactivates slowly, and it recovers fairly slowly, too, um, and takes time. So now we come to delayed rectification. So the delayed rectifier is on a completely different time scale. Look at the time scale at the bottom of this. 2,500 2, milliseconds. Whereas up here, 
you're looking at this, and this is maybe 200, 300 milliseconds wide. So over a course of seconds, this builds up. So your action potential is not very long. It's relatively short, unless you get those excessively prolonged ones, like we saw from the work of Dr. Anselovich. So it, it, here is a set of data. And this is average data, again, voltage clamp. You start out holding at minus 90, you step positive to a potential. And you go up and up and up until you get about to maybe zero millivolts or so. You start to activate a current. And it turns on very slowly with a sigmoid delay in time. So you wouldn't think that this would be very important. But it's this slowness in time because it also turns off very slowly in time. So it turns on and it turns off. And what that ends up being is it's almost like an, a ticker. It can integrate things. So if you are changing your heart rate, it'll build up slowly and it'll decay slowly on return to rest. And so in a sense, it takes into account the recent memory of your heart rate. So it builds up with sustained depolarization or activity. That's really a key. You have this slow current here that if you start having a big rapid heart rate, you start building up this repolarization current. Why would that be good? Well, if you've got a rapid heart rate, your heart has to do two things. We think of it as contracting. Well, that's good. You need it to contract nice and hard. But it also needs to do something else. It has to fill. And so if it's going to fill, it has to relax. That means you can't sustain a high heart rate and a long action potential for very long. Otherwise, you will not have enough diastolic interval to refill. And so to tune this up, the slow delayed rectifier will build up with this behavior and it will repolarize the action potentials sooner. So it's sort of a control mechanism. And you can see this type of behavior here. Now, there are other factors that get turned, tuned up or revved up with this. But in terms of the action potential, it's fairly important. You see if you go along here in a very slow cycle length, you see almost no change in the action potential. It's not really doing much of anything. Things get down, they go, they recover, they have plenty of time to get back to where they were before the next impulse arrives, unless it's an action potential. You speed up, there's not really much difference. But then you start to get to a critical cycle length where the action potential then starts to shorten and shorten severely as you get faster and faster so that you have longer and longer time in which to uh, recover your channels to their original states and as you have a chance to relax the myocardium. Now, obviously, you're not rec recovering all of them to their original state or you wouldn't get this type of, of, of uh, shortening. And that's because those delayed rectifiers build up with time and help shorten the action potentials. But you can see here at this rate, <coughs> at five beats per second, which you're going pretty darn fast at that point, you wouldn't even have enough time to repolarize at all if you had still had an action potential of this length. It's really straight from one to the next. And so this regulation of the basic cycle length changes some things. So as you go faster, you get shorter action potentials. More of the myocardium is uniformly polarized. As you go slower, you have much prolonged activation, particularly in the epicardium and mid-myocardium. And you see changes in the spike and dome. As this transient outward current, as you might expect, starts to become less and less prominent as you go faster and faster. You don't have this spike and dome. You don't have this behavior. You don't have this interaction. Uh, with fast repolarization. So again, this diversity of action potentials uh, is reflected by the diversity in ion channels, and that gives rise to changes that, despite looking very similar at some rates, are very different in different other regions. And so different regions have different action potentials, and they're specialized. And probably the most specialized of all of the action potential activity is the SA node. I've been talking about all these things, and I showed you the ventricular things. I keep talking about an impulse coming along and stimulating the heart. Now, I've said the heart doesn't need external stimuli in order to beat. 
And that's because it has its own intrinsic pacemaker, the sinoatrial node. It doesn't require any input in order to initiate rhythmic activity. And it provides the impulse that normally spreads to the rest of the heart and causes behavior. So you have the sinoatrial node here. This is really, this is it. It beats rhythmically. It passes current to your left or right atrium. It goes through a delay area here, which is another specialized type of tissue, which can serve as a pacemaker as well, the AV node. Uh, it goes through the his Purkinje system to rapidly excite both ventricles fairly evenly and provide you with a rapid contraction. So if we look at this on an EKG, and everybody probably recognizes the EKG because probably everybody watches television. This is the thing that they show you whenever they want to tell you someone's in the hospital and maybe going to die. Um, and then, you know, they dramatically go flat and die. Um, they're used a lot in the hospitals, and they are very real. And they tell us some actual real information as opposed to merely serving as a prop in movies. We have the P wave, the QRS complex, the ST segment, which really defines going from the end of the S wave to the T wave. And these are the main properties that you will need to know about this. And don't worry about it right now. We're going to go through it. But this reflects at the surface of your body the uh, events that are occurring in your heart. And the reason we can measure these at the surface of the body is their field potential. So as you have current, current goes through a cell membrane and it goes out into the fluid surrounding it to form a circuit. If the amount of tissue you have is large enough, it generates enough electricity that we can measure those small whorls of, of current at the cell surface. So a lot of this is dependent on the size of the tissue and particularly of the size of the current source. So that large sodium current that gives you your DVDT is responsible for this QRS complex. It's in your ventricle, by far the largest chamber in your heart as well as the largest current. We can also see repolarization of that tissue. This is the T wave, represents repolarization of the ventricle. For the early events, we see this P wave. This P wave is contraction of the atria. We don't have all this complexity of the QRS and T wave and the P wave. And we don't see that for a reason. That's because the atria are a much smaller, more diffuse set of tissue. We see the excitation wave spreading through all of it. It's a smaller tissue, smaller current source, uh, just smaller in general. We don't see the SA node at all because the SA node is a very, very small piece of tissue. So you like the cardiogram? And we'll, we'll, this will be mentioned to you again later. You need to know these things. P wave corresponds to the excitation of the atrium. The QRS corresponds to the depolarization of the ventricle. And the T wave corresponds to the repolarization phase of the ventricle. The SA node is, if you look at the crista terminalis right here where the superior vena cava comes in and the right atrium free walls, so the thin sort of tissue of that, is a small anatomical region near the cell surface here. That's the sinoatrial node. That's why you can't actually record electrical activity at the surface of your body from the sinoatrial node. It's a very small region of tissue. It takes a while to get enough current out into the regional regions and to create the pacemaking behavior. It is an intrinsic pacemaker. It's, it oscillates. It causes currents generates currents in an oscillatory behavior. It goes through an action potential firing without any of the problems of, of any other external stimulus. And like other nodal, nodal tissue, it's a calcium-mediated action potential. So how does it do this? Well, it does it the way any other oscillator does. It's not got a single stable operating point. That is, it doesn't have a resting membrane potential. You can't speak of the resting membrane potential of the sinoatrial node. You can always talk about its maxim, maximum diastolic potential. So as it repolarizes, it goes through this phase. Following that phase, it goes through what's known as a diastolic depolarization. 
this is a very, very slow change in membrane potential that occurs until it very it gets up to minus 40. Minus 40, tricky point. Remember, that's that activation threshold for the calcium current. So it gets there, and the calcium fires an all or none action potential. And so diastolic depolarization is the phase that really sets the length and duration of this interval between excitatory beats in your intrinsic pacemaker. And there are a lot of ways that you can change that. You could change it by changing the slope of the diastolic depolarization. You can change it by changing the maximum diastolic interval and making it longer. Uh, sorry, maximum diastolic potential. Or you can change it by changing the all or none threshold to lengthen or shorten this. So there are several factors that can work depending on what currents you're modulating during this and which ones are active. Now, I say depending on which ones are active because there's actually a current debate in the literature about what sorts of currents and how they uh, control this. We have, I'm going to show you one particular version um, and merely point out that this other version exists and probably contributes somewhat to it in human tissue, but much more prominently perhaps in rodents. So there's no stable membrane potential. That's important. If I ask you what the resting membrane potential of a sinoatrial node cell is, the answer is the sinoatrial node does not have a resting membrane potential. It does have a maximum diastolic potential, and it has a diastolic depolarization phase. That diastolic depolarization phase is really due to several factors that interact during it. In your textbook, it looks at the interaction between the IF current and the delayed rectifier. So remember I told you about the delayed rectifiers. They turn on slowly, they turn off slowly. And they sort of integrate with time. And here you see this behavior here. We have our SA node plumping along. We have K current turning on. We have the K current during negative potential starting to turn off, turning on, turning off, turning on, turning off. At the same time, there's this IF, which is a funny current. Now, I'm giving you a definition of activation, and it's good for most channels, except for IF, which is called the funny current, or the queer current, the hyperpolarization activated current. Um, it had a lot of names. Uh, the choices of them were made a long time ago. Uh, the queer current you'll still see is IQ, uh, which was not as politically incorrect as it might have se might seem now. Uh, it was uh, developed by uh, Irasawa and his group in Japan, who found it to be a very, very queer current in that it turned on when the other currents were turning off. That is, it turns on with hyperpolarization. So hyperpolarization activates this channel. That's why it's called IH, I hyperpolarization activated, or IF for funny current, because the British group thought it was kind of funny that it uh, turned on uh, with hyperpolarization, as opposed to any of the other currents that we knew about, which turned on with depolarization. Uh, and the di that would be Dario Di Francesco and Dennis Noble at Oxford, who called it IF. And you'll see all of these in the current in the current literature, depending on who's writing it still. Um, so IQ, IF, RIH, but hyperpolarization activated current. And so it provides, because it turns on at negative potential, inward current during the diastolic depolarization. Because you need a net balance here of inward and outward currents. It's fairly small, but that inward over a fairly long period of time. We also have the calcium current here. And that gets excited here, provides their upstroke. And the all or none repolarization active during the plateau. And then, of course, it, it, here it's deactivated, recovers from inactivation, ready to go on the next phase. There is some argument here, and I'll mention it now, but we'll not bring it up on the test, that sodium, that calcium, other mechanisms involving calcium, particularly the sodium calcium exchanger, may also be modulating an important part of this clock concept. But the thing that's really important about the SA node is not what's here. 
It's what's not here. And so the SA node is missing a stabilized inward rectifier current. It doesn't have that high K conductance at the resting membrane potential. And because it doesn't have that, that potential is unstable. You can, by blocking IK1, you can render most excitable cardiac cells automatic. They will start to pace simply by blocking that current. So that's really the thing that makes it a pacemaker cell is the lack of an inward rectifier current. But there's also an additional inward current, this IF or IH or IQ, that turns on during diastolic depolarization. It is called the pacemaker current as well. And it is, without a doubt, an important pacemaker modulatory current under its very strong uh, neurohormonal control. And so the magnitude of that current can and does play an extremely important role in regulating the rate at which your physiologic pacemaker fires in response to neurohormonal uh, interactions. And it also then requires the slowly developing and slowly decaying away potassium current, that delayed rectifier. And that's what sets up these oscillations. So remember, it's not got this. This inward rectifier, and inward rectifier just means it's bent. It doesn't pass inward, it passes inward current below the reversal potential and not in the outward direction very well. All right, so it's lacking that, but it does have this. This is the delayed rectifier current. I showed you it earlier in a set of simulated type of data and just the first half of this. So where you've stepped positive here from holding potential of minus 70, you watch this current, you go positive, positive, positive. As you go from minus 80, you control out, it goes positive, 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 not much happens. You hit a threshold here, minus 50 or so, and it starts to turn on very, very slowly. More and more positive, it starts to turn on slower and slower, or faster and faster, until it gets quite fast at very positive potentials. And then more importantly, when you drip, dip back to minus 70, what you find is that this current slowly, slowly decays away. So if you look at this one second time scale, if you're thinking about action potentials and art rates at one or two beats per second, this decay is pretty good. It's right in the middle of a region that you need to be sensitive to the amount of time you're spending in diastolic depolarization. So it's the right time frame for it. It turns on slowly, it turns off slowly. It's activated at positive potentials, and then it deactivates at negative potentials. Notice I said deactivates. Deactivation is the reverse of the process of activation. So it turns on with a time course. That's activation. Now, the other currents we showed you were transient. They inactivate. This current does not inactivate. It does not inactivate, so it just stays open. As long as it's open, it's fine. If it's depolarized, it'll get more and more open over a very long time course. And if you repolarize, that activation gate shuts down in the process known as deactivation. And so it deactivates at negative potentials. It does so slowly. Slowly is the important part of it. So this is what it looks like. Now, when we look at IH, and here we have some IH data from uh, heterologously expressed um, HCN channels. And what these look like is an upside-down version of the delayed rectifier. They turn on slowly, but here, instead of going, we go positive, we get no current. We get a little bit of leak current. There's a, an artifact here. It's known as a capacitance transient. comes with the experiments. But the current itself is this stuff here. If you step positive, you get no extra current, no extra current. You start stepping negative. Eventually, you hit a threshold where you start to see this time-dependent development of current. As you go more and more negative, so as you're stepping negative, you get a very big inward current. You step positive, and this current just turns slowly, slowly off, or turns slowly on, depending on how much it was activated before. This is minus 120. So you have a current that turns on and is inward. So it's downward. That's what it means. That inward currents are negative and therefore downward. So it's the opposite direction and sort of a similar time course to the deactivation of the 
delayed rectifier current. And of course, as you step more positive, it will turn off. So it's a non-selective current. That's why it's inward at negative potential. It doesn't carry just so it's, it's very unusual. This is one other reason it was called the funny current uh, is that it was non-selective. All the other channels we've talked about today were very selective. They carry potassium or they carry chloride or they carry sodium or they carry calcium and they don't carry anything else. This channel was funny. It carried both, sodium and potassium. That meant it had a, a reversal potential somewhere in between EK and ENA. In fact, somewhere near zero millivolts. So it's all kind of backwards from everything I've told you about channels so far. It's non-selective. It activates and opens up with sustained hyperpolarization instead of depolarization. It's inward at negative potentials. Of course, it has to follow thermodynamics, so that, that's fine. Um, and it helps generate a, an inward current that can speed up that diastolic depolarization. And it's the exception of the rule for the definition of activation and deactivation. So everything is backwards for it. Activates at negative potentials, deactivates at positive potentials, and it's the exception to the rule uh, for these. It has been looked at as a target for various drugs, uh, particularly to help uh, treat six sinus syndrome and help uh, patient, patients avoid the implantable uh, device. Okay. And so the thing to remember about the pacemaker depolarization is it's still it's a cycle. Outward current, inward current, outward current, inward current, balancing to give you a diastolic depolarization, calcium current providing an excitatory phase and a plateau, and it goes through these cycles in a regenerative type of behavior. So it goes, shuts off the potassium current from the previous action potential during that thing, the activation of the hyperpolarization current helps keep it going and it reaches the threshold for firing of the calcium current, and that's what fires your next action potential and resets the entire cycle. Thank you very, very much. So if the bars are low.